Somebody called the pastor and said, uh, I'd like to come preach for you. He says, uh, he says, well, uh, what is your ministry? He said, well, I'm a preacher. He said, well, no, thank you. I'm looking for some ministers. All of a sudden, I had to begin to realize that maybe there's some things that have been laid on my foundation that I had been taught that I embraced, believed, preached, they hard taught, to remove, and they're hard to, re -taught, to, to remove. And those things had been instilled in my life. The world system is dog eat dog. Uh, be the best you can be, you know, success. I'm me. number one. S I got to look out for myself. S-I-N. I is always in the middle. Pride. P-R-I in the middle. D-E. Reformist in his theology, and I, I don't want to take the time to explain, except they believe they don't have free will, you know, and uh, God saves who he wants to save and sends to hell, and it, it's a long story. But Chuck Swindoll was on the radio, and it changed my life many years ago. He said, you know what? He said, I went to our annual uh, out-of-town retreat, and where there's canoeing, there's bait, softball, you know, they have breakfast, lunch. And he said, when I got up that morning, I went into the, uh, into the breakfast area, and there was a long line. Come on, pastor, come on. And they put him in the front of the line. Uh, when they played baseball, pastor, you bat first, okay? Uh, they went canoeing. Oh, pastor, mm -hmm. you get in the canoe first. And he went back home. Now, this impacted my life. Yeah. I remember it. This is 30 years ago. And... Um, he said, when I got back to my room, I started thinking, is that what a pastor should be? First in line to eat, first in line in a canoe. For, everything was catered around him instead of him being a servant and a minister to the people. Preferring and and I'm going to tell you, uh, Pastor Bill, it, it, it literally affected my life where I, I can't. I can't do any of that anymore exactly. because I see through it now. <clears throat> and, and the church has to come back. The pastoral ministry has to come back. We're servants. Right. We're, we're, we're ministers of the gospel. Somebody called the pastor and said, uh, I'd like to come preach for you. He says, uh, he says, well, uh, what is your ministry? He said, well, I'm a preacher. He said, well, no, thank you. I'm looking for some ministers. Yeah. <laughs> you know? Yeah. Yeah. And, and it, we got to come to the place where we recognize the kingdom is the opposite of the world system. The world system is dog eat dog. Uh, be the best you can be, you know, success. I'm me. number one. S I got to look out for myself. S I N. I is always in the middle. Pride. P R I in the middle. D E. The greatest fish in the Bible was not. The one that swallowed Jonah. It's the selfish. Right. The biggest and, and, fish. And the church has to come back to where we humbly. The definition of humility, we talked about this, is to totally, completely depend on him and not yourself. Exactly. Okay. He did it all for me. I didn't save myself. Okay. No. I tell him all the time. Let me say this because it's a great illustration. When, when he talks about he's the good shepherd. Okay. And he talks about in John 10. The sheepfold, my sheep know my voice. I'm the door, you go in and out. That's all metaphorical to how a shepherd protected his sheep from the wolves, how he brought, led them into green pasture in uh, the book of uh, Psalms 23. The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. And when you look at that whole allegorical uh, parallel that it's God himself, okay, that purchased us with his own blood. So when you go purchase sheep, okay, or you, you uh, have a system where you're, you're uh, mating them and, and creating sheep from the ones you already have, you have a responsibility over those sheep. Right. You have to provide for them. You have to, that's the Lord. And we're sitting here 
trying to do it all on our own and trying to be self-sufficient when self-sufficiency is the opposite of dependency upon him. That's Somebody said you, when I got saved, oh, you need a crutch. No, I need about 30 of these kind of crutches. Man, this man, my God. Anything that upholds me, anything that makes me more stable, anything that produces the life that we've enjoyed, right. our families. We would have never had families, uh, no. Pastor Bill. We wouldn't be here. We wouldn't be here. We'd be dead. How exactly. many How many of our friends we've buried? Oh, a number You can't of them. count them. Right. Okay? And uh, so this thing has to become, uh, the church has to become, uh, the idea of not many mighty, not many noble, not many wise. That's who we are. Yeah. God has chosen the foolish things. People can't even say that about themselves. I can say it without reserve because the more that, that I give God the glory right. and that he did it all, and all I did was just accept the gift. He gave me a gift. I received it. There's no debt involved. I don't owe God anything for that. Because Romans 4 says, if it's a debt, God's a debtor to no man. God owes us nothing. Right. Right? Right. But he chooses to put his affection upon us. Right. And love us unconditionally. Now, I want to switch gears a little bit right now. And I want to get into uh, some thoughts. And I know this will be a blessing to you too, Pastor Bill, because uh, I think this kind of uh, surmises and it opens up the door for where we want to go into the future with these volumes. Now, we don't know how many of these programs will do, but the idea is that all of the years, my 44, your 43 years, and all of the, uh, the ideas and understandings that we have that God's been teaching us for the last 20 years, and we, we've not, I, like I said, I have not written a book. I, I could write tons of books, uh, Pastor Bill, you know that. But I wanted to make sure, like Paul in Galatians 2, he went to the pillars of the church. And here's what he said. He laid this revelation that God gave him when he was caught up into the third heaven right. in 2 Corinthians 12. And he said it this way. I went to them because they were pillars of the church, lest what I was teaching, I would be a castaway. I would be in error. Am I teaching error here? So... You know, it's not like Paul was so confident at the beginning because it was so contrary to what he was taught, like right, us. Right. Remember, we talked about you withstood me somewhat in, in my teaching when I be, first began, God first began to reveal this to me. But over time now, you, you, you either right there with me or surpass me right. because you caught the vision of it and the understand. But at first it was difficult. Yeah, and, and the thing about it is, is the reason... I questioned it is because of what I had previously been taught and the foundation that had already All been laid us. in my life. And so everything that I heard, I judged it according to and by the foundation and the teachings that I had received, which was intense because of the four years that we were in college. But then as time went on, God began to, well, especially with the event with my daughter and going through that, God opened my eyes to his love and how unconditional it was. And from that point on, all of a sudden, I had to begin to realize that maybe there's some things that have been laid on my foundation that I had been taught, that I embraced, believed, preached, They're hard taught, to remove. And they're hard to, to, to remove. And those things had been instilled in my life at, early on, which I was very impressionable. And, and that was the, if, you know, I, so I received it. And when God began to bring this revelation about, about the grace, the gospel of grace, all of a sudden, the first thing that I began to realize was that there were things on my foundation that I had built my life on, my walk with God on, had to be changed. Because now the truth was coming out. The word, the, the scriptures were beginning to reveal to me what Jesus truly did through his his life and his death, burial, and resurrection. And I say that all the time because I drive that home because I want you to realize that's where it all stemmed from, was from his death, burial, and resurrection. We now have a relationship that's built on, on the grace of God in a major way. And so I had to start allowing God to reveal the word to me. I had to start reading it with a preconceived doctrinal position you know, that I had developed in my life through 
the years of teaching and study on my own, and I had to remove those restraints and open up my heart and open up my understanding and get outside the box, so to speak, that I had been caught, you know, uh, was in. And when I began to do that, all of a sudden, the light began to go on. God began to show me, hey, this scripture is not what they're teaching you and telling you is right. And then all of a sudden, the, the message started taking on a whole new meaning. And you know what really did it for me too, Pastor? Well, I think personally, this is me speaking. I know that God has revealed a lot of in-depth things to you, okay, and we're going to talk about them. But there, there's one major event that happened in my life years ago. It was the day I called you up on the telephone, and I said, Pastor, God showed me what the tree of the knowledge of good and evil is. I had never known what the tree of the knowledge of good and evil was. And at first, you withstood me on it based on same principle. Okay, you, let's, let, let's, you see let's, what I'm saying? Let's develop that because why, Pastor Bill? Because of I what you've been taught. That's right. That's a great example. Although yeah. we're not going to get into the tree of the knowledge and good, uh, 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 good and evil right now because it's such a vast subject. Oh, it's an excellent. But it's a, it's a, uh, it's a definite it's foundational. Well, it's a, a great illustration you're using to illustrate. Here's Paul said it. Uh, uh, um, King Agrippa, when Paul stood before him and started espousing all of these revelations God gave him, he said, much learning has made you mad. Yeah. Okay. And so. Thou almost persuadest me when he right. spoke. So, so my stumbling block was the law did not come till 430 years after Abraham. Right. Okay. Now, I now understand that when uh, at 1200 years before Christ, some 30, uh, 600 years, uh, no. Uh, 2,600 or 28, yeah, 2,600 years from Adam, Moses comes. So you got 430 years from uh, Abraham, and then you got uh, uh, about 1,200 uh, B.C., before Christ, mm -hmm. you got Moses. Well, they did not have Genesis to uh, uh, Deuteronomy, right. chapter 34. They didn't have the Torah. They didn't have it until... The law didn't come till all the way uh, 1,200 years before Christ came to this earth. After 2,400 years, there was no law. Now, when we get into it, let me explain it to you this way. When you called me and told me that the tree of the knowledge of good and evil represented the law. Yeah, I had never heard law. that. Me I need. went through Bible college. Me neither. I had never heard it. And I could truthfully say... And I always speak truthfully, openly. Sure. Yeah. I don't like to use the word, uh, I'm telling you the truth. No. <laughs> I, I'm, I'm going to, with my best yeah. efforts, yeah. always say the truth, but not always be open. We, we, like, I'm we not going to discuss my relationship. You better be truthful. <laughs> we got you on camera. You better be truthful. No, right. But no, the, the, the no, point is. Understand. No, the point is that I'm thinking the law doesn't come until 430 years after Abraham. So how could the tree be the law when the law don't come here? Now, let me show you how God converted me. Yeah. But, I, I'm going to tell you how. Amen. And then, but at the same time, it was based on your foundation of your understanding of when the law came into the picture. Uh, that's right. And thinking that that was the origin of it when it was introduced to Moses. Yeah. Uh, so immediately I rejected it. Exactly. On the basis that the law didn't come until this time. Right. Okay? And so... What happened in that, that whole... Uh, How did God convert you? Well, well, that's what I'm talking about. It is strange, yeah. okay? To me, and, and I don't want anybody to take this wrong, okay? Okay. But uh, when, when I watch something on television, like a Christian program, and there's certain ministers on there, which I, I don't watch a lot of uh, the Christian TV yeah. because there's so many things out there that, man, it, it just almost discourages me, right? But... In watching it, they had a minister on that I knew, and now uh, he's been exposed, and, and he's out of the ministry, okay? So I never did ascribe to this guy. But just to listen to him, to see what they believe, right? right? right. I was listening to him. And little did I know that guy would say something that would totally change my life, mm, okay? That's good. Here's what he said. He said... The law did not come till Moses. 
And he said, up until that time, you didn't have any reference points at all. But yet, when it was given to him, it was the first five books of the law, which is Genesis 1-1, all the way through Deuteronomy 34. Right. He called it the first five books of the law. Okay? The Pentateuch. The Pentateuch. Now watch this. So when he said that, he caught my attention. And now I understand when we get in depth, right. what we're going to see is that the law was indeed the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. And it says it in Romans 3.31, uh, for by the law is the knowledge of sin. So Adam, when he ate the tree, the law now made him culpable, made him responsible and recognized that he had already done wrong. And we'll get into right, that, okay? Right. But that's not for this program. Right. And so I saw where God removed his tabernacle. And what you see, and, and, and this is mind-boggling, Pastor Bill, and I know there's going to be a bunch of people that will not receive what I'm going to say. But if they'll stay with the programs yeah. and let us vet it out, Stink, think show outside the, scripture, the box, throw, show them the scripture. What God did, according to Romans 4.15, where there is no law, okay, right. sin cannot be imputed. Uh, imputed. Like if there's no speed limit on uh, Audubon, they can't give you a ticket. Right, okay? exactly. So God saw the volatility of the law, so he removed the law. And when he removed the law, there was total lawlessness all the way to the flood. And then what God did, he, the temporal judgment, he had to judge them according to the law for their wickedness. But then when he died, Peter says he went and preached to the lost souls. What was he preaching? Well, you see, it, it wasn't, that's a nah, big nah, question. Nah, nah, nah. No. What, nah, nah, nah. Aborigine it, pygmy that's never had a missionary talk to him. He can look at the sky and tell that there's a creator. Now he's responsible and he gets sent to hell because he never heard the name of Jesus. Now, nobody's buying that, Pastor. Nobody's buying that. God's a just God. And I watch my mother sit and weep and yeah. cry because she felt like... Well, religion is terrible. It is. Still. It is. It, it's deadly. It's, it's, a, it's deadly. And the enemy uses it to badger people with. Yes. And I watch my mother weep time and time and oh, time yeah. again. Well, I didn't know how to address that because I wasn't saved yet. Today, it's 40 lines around the world. We're not making progress. Right. And this gospel has to be preached to every living creature. So you're telling me because these people never heard the name of Jesus, God's going to make them suffer an eternal hell of torment and never got the chance to hear Jesus. I don't buy it.